Hello, welcome everyone to the HVAC 2.0 show. I'm Nate Adams, the CEO, joined by a chunk of the guild here. So we've got Mr. Tanner Dickerson, Mr. Uh, Default Aggressive down in Alabama, um, and his brother from another mother, but with a very different uh, uh, viewpoint, Mr. Abby up in Canada, um, in Winnipeg. So he, he, he helps ask good questions and kind of keep us moving. Um, and then we got Mr. Ken Dean, Mr. HVAC Emeritus um, uh, in uh, Athens, Ohio. And actually, I'm just popping Austin in here. Mr. Austin. Hey, guys. In uh, Indiana. So uh, um, Austin will probably have a story or two for us tonight to talk. So we're going to try... Uh, it, it, this is honestly, it, this is what we did. Like we've, we've been holding a Monday meeting for about five years now at eight o'clock and we just turned it into a show and we're going to go to a pretty similar format to what we used to do, which is where we, uh, we discuss a project or a problem and then we bat it around pro and con it, try and look at both sides of it, try to understand what the client is trying to accomplish and then go from there. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to try doing here. And this will be the format, hopefully a fair amount of the time, because we want questions from all of you that are watching or listening. So uh, send in your questions and uh, we want them to be project focused, not just uh, we, we don't want it to be all theory because the theory gets kind of old. We need to have the application mixed with the theory. Um, and HVAC 2.0 is a technical sales process. So the questions are going to be predominantly technical or sales related, <laughs> shockingly enough. Um, and oftentimes the two will be intertwined. Um, and uh, we were joking before the show in in all of our worlds here, uh, to, in the home performance world, there's really only two consistent answers. The first one is it depends. And the second one is closed cell spray foam. Because if you have an insulation problem, it's almost always the answer uh, or one of the best answers. Uh, so I wanted to kind of open that up with this. And then we're going to just bat things around in pro and con. But I want to tell you all the, the story of a house that we're working on right now. So it's kind of strange. When we moved down here to West Virginia, I basically gave up my infield practice uh, in Cleveland. Uh, but we keep buying houses and... We're pretty good at finding them that need HVAC and pretty good at finding them that have really bad shells. <laughs> um, it, it ends up being kind of funny where I'm the you client. become your best client. Yeah, I become my best client um, or sometimes my worst client because I need to uh, work with my wife to get things done as well. And we tend to be pretty frugal financially. Um, and the, the one that I'm thinking of here. Uh, it's a, uh, we, we bought it and we'll just say it was rough. So it was an animal situation and we haven't ever actually had to gut a house. This is the ninth house that we've turned around, um, in, in our marriage. And, uh, this one was just bad. So we gutted the whole thing. We filled four dumpsters and went from there. So we had it all open and Mr. Jeff Howard is here. Welcome Jeff. Um, and so we, we had all the walls open. So I could have just run closed cell spray foam because remember, that's one of the answers. <laughs> it's right up there with 42. We just don't know what the question is. Uh, but it, we have something here in West Virginia that is extremely unusual, which is a surplus of labor. So there's a whole lot of people around here that are super mechanical, but generally don't have enough work to keep them busy all the time. So uh, it's not necessarily that hard to run labor heavy uh, options where otherwise you wouldn't. Um, and so I was like, all right, I, there's two different ways to do this. We can spray foam it or it's a 1950 ranch. It has one by six, uh, wall, um, not studs, wall sheathing basically, but there's little gaps in between. So you have to caulk all those gaps. And, uh, one of our neighbor kids, she's 14 and I gave her about five minutes of training of what I wanted. And she went around and she caulked the whole house and I had to do very little QC on it. Um, and she got every crack that I could find taken care of. That was pretty amazing. And she was using a lot of caulk to get it done. Um, every stud bay took an entire tube. So it was quite a bit. Uh, but I wanted to do it for a couple of reasons. One is uh, my wife would much rather 
see a couple hundred bucks at a time go out to labor than one five or seven thousand dollar spray foam bill all at once. In the end, it's probably going to be the same money, is my strong suspicion. Uh, but uh, you know what? It's I feel like Ron Swanson. Uh, so I have a permit. I do what I want. Um, <laughs> and like, well, you know what? Let's just try this. We actually have labor. I, I can watch it pretty easily. Let's see what happens. The funny thing is it isn't anywhere close enough to being able to blow a door test. So I don't know how great it is yet. It is drywalled. So there's no fixing it now. Uh, but uh, um, I'm pretty confident it'll work just fine. Well, and you also have a lot of friends in the neighborhood that you're keeping employed. So there was an, another pretty strong motivation. Yep, exactly. Um, so there's two neighbors in particular here are very mechanical and they don't necessarily have a huge number of hours available, but they can usually work somewhere between 10 and 25 hours a week. So like the extra dough. Yeah, they get the extra dough. We're helping out the economy more directly. Mm -hmm. So instead of the money going just to spray foam chemical, um, and a spray foam company, it's going to our neighbors. So there's a couple of different things there. Um, uh, but, uh, like that's, it's an interesting way to, to look at the whole situation because that like part of this decision is based on my wife, not like, liking to write large checks all at once. Um, part of it is me just being like, Oh, what the heck? We'll try this out. So I don't know that this is the right answer. Um, but it is one answer. This is where an it depends, uh, comes in. And I don't know what, what do you guys think of the that strategy and what else might you have done with a different client? Would there have been anything else that you might've tried with an older home where you had open walls? It depends on the, the desire to DIY for the owner. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, depends what's the timeline. What is it that actually they're worried about? How much do they want to do it? You know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like the two questions we, we ask in the comfort consult on a scale of one to 10, where are you on uh, DIY ability of one being which end of the screwdriver do I use and 10 Bob Vila. Yeah. Um, and then the second one is, but how much time do you have, you know, from one, no time at all to uh, 10, 24, seven. So yeah, that's, that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, that's a, I had one client I suggested do this and, She's like, man, I'm, I'm happy to do a whole bunch of work that is just kind of painstaking. And man, she just nailed it. Um, uh, and it was, it was kind of fun to see that. So she didn't get a blower door test, but I got to see her electric bills and she's in uh, rural Wyoming. So it's pretty cold. Design temperature is minus 20, something like that, minus 20 Fahrenheit. And she's like, these these uh, electric bills seem high, and her high bill is like 170 bucks. <laughs> I'm like, you did fine in an all-electric house. Um, I think that's pretty amazing, Mara. Um, so, yeah, it's a, definitely one of the pieces of the puzzle is DIY. Um, and... So we got one comment coming in here. That's a R134 a hole. Love it. Um, <laughs> uh, how about using foam uh, four by eight roof panels and then filling the gaps with foam? Um, that could work. Are you thinking inside or outside for doing something like that, interior or exterior? Because um, yeah, that would be another way. That sounds like more of a new construction path, but either way works. Yeah. Um, what other factors come in mind? What, what other way might you all have dealt with that had the client been different from me and my wife? Oh, may I address that question? Yeah, if, yeah heck yeah. I want you to jump in. If he uses panels, um, I'm thinking of a project we did years ago. We did both the electrical and uh, HVAC and trying to get receptacles anywhere any any wiring any switches any of the electrical components was nearly impossible so unless you're going to do a second layer to uh, fur things out um it presents a lot of problems insulation and, and air sealing wise it sounds good probably close to icf yeah yeah actually i hadn't thought about it what i wonder if what he means is taking uh sheets of foam cutting it to size and stuffing it in the wall cavities. Oh, okay. Um, I hadn't even yes. thought about that. That might've been it. That, that could very well be it. Uh, 
But that could also be a challenge if there's any existing wiring or if you want to run new wiring because yeah. you, you'd eat up, say you run two inch foam, you, you'd eat, eat that up. But, you know, closed cell foam is going to have similar issues too. So mm -hmm. there's pluses and minuses to everything. Um, so that's a good one. Um, all right. I realized I failed to do something I meant to do earlier, which is ask Tanner to define what open mat means. Cause we, we picked this name for a reason. So Tanner, what the heck is open mat? Yeah. So if anyone has ever trained in jujitsu, you probably already know what this means, but basically, uh, in jujitsu, when it comes to training, there's kind of, you have your typical like structured training class where you have an instructor, he goes, okay, we're going to focus on this particular technique or uh, in this type of situation. And everybody works on the same thing. It's very structured. Everybody, you know, follows the same thing and whatnot. Open mat is like an alternative to where it's just kind of a free for all time. There's no structured instruction. There's no, you know, here's what you need to do. Here's what level, like it's all belt ranks. Everybody can do whatever. And you can kind of choose, do you want to spar? Do you want to roll? Do you want to do drills? Do you want to work on techniques? You know, whatever. So the premise is that. And so we kind of apply it here of being just, you know, a free for all for anything, you know, does, does someone want to work on role playing on a cell situation? Uh, are you having issues in a, you know, particular spot, you know, we can, like we'll work on that. Or if it's, Hey, I'm going over this project and there's some technical details that I'm not sure about, you know, we'll go over that. So it's kind of just opened up for any and everything. And you just kind of play it by ear and let it play out how it plays out. Sharpening your skills on a particular <clears throat> move. <laughs> yes. So what, what happens Tanner, if you go pick a fight with somebody who's better than you? Yeah. <laughs> um, you get your ass beat is what you get. <laughs> <clears throat> nah, I mean, I people mean, are good at kind of fighting down to your level, right? Like, no yeah, one wants I mean, to, yeah, yeah. yeah, it really, you can, it's a, uh, I mean, you can kind of go train and spar with whoever and it's just kind of a, you know, it's just, it's a practice room. It's anything can happen. Like everything that you do, you're doing it to get better. So it doesn't matter if you're completely outmatched or if you're not like each thing that happens, it's just meant to just slowly sharpen your swords, you know, get better rather than going out and trying to practice something on a client that you're not sure about. You can work out those kinks at open map. And so that's what you can do. So Austin, how many, uh, have you had any comfort consults in the last week? Uh, this week, well, today's Monday. So last week, uh, yeah, I think I had two or three, a lot of, uh, follow-up visits from, uh, reports that like the one that I reached out to Nate on and then one that, uh, I got some training from Jeff on for a load. So I had a lot of follow-ups and then just a couple come for consults. Anything in particular that was interesting about them or that you feel like you did well or like you feel like you did poorly? The the one that I actually reached out to Nate on, we're talking about DIY stuff. So um, it turns out that guy's actually super game for it. Like we talked about some air sealing stuff. There's like six knee wall attics upstairs. So we had talked about sealing up, you know, attic access doors, things like that. Um, he has tons of older can lights. So a lot, uh, he's a mechanical engineer. He's a really cool guy. Um, so he's super game for it. Um, I talked to Nate about it, and he brought up the sliding scale in the report, right, on from a scale from one end of screwdriver to Bob Villa. And we had talked about, well, he might need to be in like a four or so. Guy scored like a seven or an eight. He works from home um, and has like three days a week off. So He's doing a lot of remodeling too. So that one was pretty cool just to talk about everything. It's a pretty big scope of work. Um, <laughs> so that one was pretty neat. And then the rest of them were, um, I had that report for the load that Jeff helped me on. Uh, I got clarity there. And then the rest of them were pretty, pretty simple houses, single stories, things like that. So 
they went pretty good. Um, I finished up the report. I just have to go. Uh, I still have to email with it and then maybe do a return visit. What, what I, that was a long answer, though. My bad. No, that's good. That's a great answer. That's a great <laughs> answer. How have the clients responded to it? Really good. Um, the report, I mean, is solid. It's all really mapped out there. Um, I took a couple of things from the summaries that you guys had kind of talked about. So uh, I feel like it provides really good information for them and kind of gives them a sense of direction of what maybe they would like to do with all of the sliding scales on things like the odds of success and the, the budget odds of success. Um, and then kind of sparks that additional um, conversation for things, right? and kind of generates questions for them. So I've had really good, um, really good positive feedback. And I actually, um, I actually ask for negative feedback. Um, just so if I'm, if I need to fix anything I can, or maybe I can do something better that I'm not doing. Um, and maybe it's people don't want to hurt my feelings, but nobody's told me <laughs> anything negative, right? It's all, all positive right. things. They feel like it's very involved uh, and informative and easily, dis easily dissolvable. Yeah. So the guy that's working from home, mm -hmm. do you remember how many square feet the house is? Yeah, like total it's about like 6200 condition square foot that's something oh, so, that, okay so it's really quite he's gonna have quite a few projects then yeah he's got a pool. what was the blower door he's got a pool i don't remember exactly uh i know the house was under a one-to-one -one. okay um, so I, it was under six thousand blower door maybe yeah yeah me and nate um actually had to work out the i reached out to nate to get some clarity and uh energy bill disag uh, you, have, like, you uh, needed some help with that disaggregation man that that yeah. one was tough yeah well with a pool and a bunch yeah, of other stuff the, that size house what are you gonna do usage upstairs and stuff like that Cause his wife has a like a ginormous craft area that she spends a lot of time uh when she's home so right now they're they're actually redoing their their kitchen um and the main thing was comfort issues upstairs, but then they have these two ginormous wood pillars that turns out are just there for looks and to hide ductwork <laughs> that they actually want to rip out. So then that kind oh. of sparked another thing Well, where now they're going and, you know, taking return air away from a separate system that they initially didn't want to mess with at all. So the scope of work kind of, you know balloons, balloons with those crazy houses yeah yeah once we got in there and started looking at things hmm. yeah there ain't nothing easy about that sort of thing um, yeah but i mean it, it's kind of interesting really that here's this guy in the six thousand square foot house that is game for and has bandwidth for diy That's oh yeah a, th those are not <laughs> venn circles that usually cross no right other. um yeah, yeah. He's I just want to pay there. you to get it done as a as a six thousand square foot guy usually. Yeah. Just want to say hi to Brett Wetzel. Thank you, buddy, for uh, coming on in. Austin, you you were saying you've been asking people for feedback, right? Especially mm -hmm. negative feedback. Uh, who have you been talking to? Uh, just clients. So I always ask the, um, do you feel like you receive value from today's visit? And then I'll, I'll let them answer that. And then I ask, is there anything that you wish I would have done that I didn't do? Or is there anything that you wish I would have done differently? Um, and typically it's the, no, it's been very involved because I, I bring them along throughout all of the testing, right. To show them the, the zonals and the, the thermals as long as the weather's cooperating. Um, so I feel like by then they've got a pretty good understanding plus the, the email, right? Reading that email, um, the what to expect email really, if you have a client that reads that, I feel like it really sets, sets you up for an alley-oop there to where they know what they're about to do and what's going to happen next. So one of the things to make it clear to folks um, along for the ride here is Austin's primarily doing 
uh, comfort consults. So um, he's getting paid 500 or 599 to, to go out and, and do the comfort consult process. And one of the things that happens both for comfort consult and free quote is there is a what to expect email that goes out before you go to your visit. Mm -hmm. And um, what sort of surprised us was people paying five, $600 for a comfort consult. Sometimes don't even bother reading the emails you send them. And, and they definitely wow. don't like, can I, so and then, and you've been doing some free quotes, right, Austin? Yeah. Yeah. They're sprinkled in there here and there. And, so can and I you have a what to you? email for that? Um, I, I haven't, I haven't ran a, a free quote recently to like use the, the path day, the free quote that I want to say like the last free quote I ran was probably back in like July, maybe. Oh, I got, okay. I got really busy there with comfort consults, like in the in the swing of the summer. Gotcha. So that's gotcha. that's all I've really been doing. So everything's up a, a much more live now on the free quote, and you haven't been. You haven't yeah, done. yeah, and I have a lot more. Uh, I've done, you know, watched all the videos here on that, so it's, it's provided a lot of clarity for any any questions that you do in the future. I've had. Yeah. Okay. Well, so Jeff is our free quote expert as of now. Um, Jeff and Reedy are our everything expert, but. <laughs> he knows he's amazing. Um... <laughs> one, one of the things that I feedback I've been getting from Jeff is, you know, sending the what to expect email on free quotes is a pure responsibly avoiding responsibility tactic because very few people read them yeah. and then and then once in a while you get completely surprised when you walk into the house and the lady says i want my house hvac to work just like my car hvac works <laughs> <laughs> and then you're off to the races because then you're, off, you're like four minutes oh, wait a second what off. Uh huh. Yeah, it huh? it, huh? it kind of blows your mind when when a client actually does that. Um, yeah. That actually leads me back to something we were talking about earlier today, Ted. Um, on HVAC talk, someone watched the last two episodes where we did role plays. Um, so two weeks ago was Abby and his wife, and they did an amazing job. Um, but it took some time. And so that was kind of one edge of the spectrum where you have engaged clients who didn't necessarily read anything ahead of time. Um, you know, they don't tell you they, they want their uh, house HVAC to be like their car HVAC. Um, and then Jeff and I last week role played fast. So we got through the questions in 10 minutes. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. There was a comment on HVAC talk uh, that said, I actually liked the 45 minute one quite a bit better. And oftentimes it's going to take some time anyway, because, it, well, I mean, particularly as we move into a, a slower market, because uh, I mean, I've, I've heard that manufacturers are off 20 to 30% of volume this year. That's not a small change. It's not a couple percent. It's, it's a lot. Um, and so this is going to be a trickier year. Uh, and probably a couple of years worth where we're going to need to spend some time building rapport with clients and asking them good questions and standing out in their mind. And good questions can be such a big piece of that. Um, so I thought it was really interesting uh, that uh, he enjoyed, Abby, yours that you did with your wife and then Reedy interviewing you guys uh, more so than uh, Jeff and I. It was like Jeff and I seemed almost unrealistic because we blazed through it so quickly. Um, but we, we kind of had our, so, our end caps. So let me say, let me say th something about that. I think for the people that just want a free quote, so you did it, you blazed through it as if you had already been prepared and looked at all the videos and really yeah. understood um, the comfort quiz and all that. I think that also if you were someone who just wanted like for like, mm -hmm. um, at least from feedback I've been getting from Jeff is the people that are, you know, I'm just getting three quotes. Okay. Um, end up 
end up being fast like that also. Maybe yeah. we should do a role play of that at some point. <clears throat> yeah, we can totally do one like that. But I just I, I thought it was just interesting feedback because in some ways I was like that first one felt uh, like slow to me, um, like slightly painful at moments. Um, uh, but yeah, it w- well, it felt that way to me, too. And then I went back and I looked at it when it wasn't live and and it really had a had a much better tempo because yeah i I don't know there's something different about it after after the fact well reedy's got such a gentle patient nature um and then (laughs) i'll be and his wife are kind of the same too so it's kind of interesting um seeing that and jeff and i are like but i didn't feel like we skipped anything or we rushed but we got through in 10 minutes um, so it was just interesting to see what the bookends were on that. Uh, but I mean, it's, it, it's important, like whatever process you're using, uh, it, the, the more questions you, you ask and you have to care about what the answers are, the more likely you are to stand out in their mind. And if you do a good job of figuring out what issues, if any, they want to fix and you give them options to do that, that's going to be different than, oh yeah, here you go. Here's your, your, here's your one scene. choice. 80k uh, furnace um do you want it or not um so, so let me ask austin a question related to what you're just saying uh nate so austin these these clients that you've been doing uh the comfort consult for is it clear to you that they've talked to other hvac folks as well or do you, are you the only one in the, um in- i've had I've only had a few where like the, the person straight out told me like, yeah, I've gotten four of their quotes. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the other times I feel like, and this is just me, like I haven't asked a client, but from what I'm picking up, it's almost like it's everything's so in depth to where there's uh, trust maybe uh, for a lack of a word. Um, like I've spent, tons of like hours at their house looking at things and not just come in and look at the equipment real quick and say, okay, here you go. Here's the price sign here. It's I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And, and then the interview portion of the, again, I can speak more so for comfort consults than the path day or the free quote, but there's a, there's about, there's a tons, a lot of questions there that you ask the client when you first get there, you sit down. So, um, you know, and that typically takes me, I do that for about an hour, maybe mm-hmm. an hour and a half even mm-hmm. where I'm just sitting there talking and, you know, sometimes we'll get off and we'll start talking about other things, but mm-hmm. usually by then I have a, a pretty good, you know, generalization of what, what their issues are, what their concerns are and kind of mm-hmm. what they're wanting to do. And then I spend the rest of the time going and figure out what's going on with the home. Uh, And by then I feel like it's, it's, there's a pretty good rapport established to where, um, you know, I've had clients that do things as soon as we go over the report. And then I've had clients uh, again, have straight up told me we're not doing this until the winter or next year. Right. And they're trying to be proactive with things. Um, So I haven't seen, those long-term ones come to fruition. But again, like I've, I have one that um, a client that her crawl space needed some work, right? So we've been kind of, she had asked questions about companies and things like that to maybe help with like an encapsulation. Um, And she had messaged me and told me that uh, this winter she plans on replacing equipment, right? Mm -hmm. It's an electrification project. Uh, going from gas AC to all electric. So I feel like it's, does that answer your question? Oh yeah. Okay. So in terms of like, so you, what you're saying, and you tell me if I'm wrong. So what you're saying is that maybe what distinguishes you as far as you can tell from what you're doing versus what maybe the other people who are coming in with their own quotes are doing is that this like comfort console process like, do you feel like it gives you the, the kind of like the license to to build this rapport with people? Because you're getting paid to be there, right? Because yeah. otherwise, mm-hmm. I imagine you're like when you were doing sales or technical sales before, your incentives were to just get in and get out as quick as you can. Is that right? Yeah, generally, like there. Were... 
Oh, I think we lost you there. Oh, no, no, no. There's a time allotment, right? And you don't want to go. Yeah. Right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, you might have to say that again. Bit. Um. So there was generally, yeah. I mean, there was a time allotment, right? And you don't want to go over the time because that'll hurt you. And you want to make sure that you're getting sales because if not, it goes against your numbers, right? Um. So this, I feel like, yeah, kind of maybe does give me that license, but for the other thing that I would say is more important is that it kind of lifts that uh, anxiety, maybe that you, you could say of needing to, to sell things, right? Because I feel like I'm just there to give information and options and kind of help them make an educated decision versus, oh, crap, I need to sell something, right? <laughs> Right. So you're remembering not to wear your salesman hat when you're when you're doing a comfort consult. Yeah. yeah. And then later when you come back to deliver that comfort consult, it's sort of a blended hat at that point, isn't it? Right. Because it is kind of your responsibility to help them make some decisions. Yeah. But they're still they're still paying you to to be there on a comfort consult. Right. And then and then with a the free quote, you you probably don't go back. I mean, well, again, you haven't really, really done any since we got it launched, but yeah. And, and most of mine were for, were for many splits. I don't know if that matters, but right. Uh, most of my free quotes are for many splits. So I get those in, in comfort consults. Hmm. What was the most useful feedback you got? I know you said no one as yet has given you like negative feedback or anything, but what did you find most useful? Um, I had one guy he said it wasn't negative, but he wished I could have, like, he had one giant area that was uncomfortable. And like, he was saying that he wanted me to put something in the middle of the room and tell him what side of it. I feel like he was maybe just so trying to find something to give me feedback on because the rest <laughs> of it went perfect. Right. He was the one that had read the email. Um, it was kind of set up for me when I got there super involved in everything um that was like a two-hour interview because we just talked you know got it's gotten to the point where when i first started doing these when i would do the interview it was short choppy one sentence answers and now <laughs> it's gotten to the point where you know if i sit there and try to type everything out i would have a, a 38 page book by the end of it yeah because right? you gotta the sit bad. there you got to sit there. You got to pet the dog. You got to ask yeah. them about the family reunion. And that's the whole. Well, plus you go deep and get right. the pain and you've, this is fun because, you know, everybody else here has been like through the Sandler, through doing comfort consults, you know, it's, it's old and you're brand new. So it's kind of fun to see it through new eyes again. Yeah. And you're fresh on the Sandler stuff. So like it, it's, exciting to like you're still listening to sandler on a regular basis right yeah the um the you can't teach a kid to ride a bike in a seminar i've i've i'm on the i can't tell you how many times i've listened to it but that's an audio book that i forget i think it might have been one of you guys that told me but um you said johnny had to go back and like listen to a chapter multiple times and then he would move on so mm -hmm. that's what i had that's what I had started doing. I'm um, going back and just listening to it over and over and over. Like when I'm driving to calls or like when I'm in portions of it where a client may not be with me, I'll pop it in to like a AirPod and listen to it. So do you, do you guys, and maybe this is for you too, Austin, but generally for others as well, like, um, do you run into, I mean, I'm sure you do, like run into clients who like try to ask you like the gotcha question, right? Probably very likely an engineer, like a retired engineer <laughs> <laughs> or a retired electrician. They're like, you know, what about blah, 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 blah. Like, how do you, how do you deal with those people? Reverse. Can you, can you elaborate like if, on that? I mean, it depends on the angle they're trying to go at. You know, are they trying to are they trying to state a problem and then bait you into telling them what to do to solve it and then try to get you to explain how that's going to solve it? Like if that's the method, well, then 
whatever problem they say and they if they go about well how do you think i should fix this well rather than just trying to give them a off the top answer oh i know what you, what you should do is you need a three ton you know adk ac and do this and do that install a remy halo and everything's going to be great and wonderful <laughs> Not the smartest thing to do. So obviously you want to ask them questions and go, okay, well, it sounds like this is a big problem. I mean, how big of a problem is it? Mm -hmm. And then kind of get him to telling you more about that problem and then kind of narrow down to go like for, in our example, we would offer a comfort consult if somebody has a, an issue like that. And we would just go, okay, well, that sounds like a pretty big problem. I mean, is it a big enough of a problem that five, $500 to kind of get an idea of how to address this? It's going to be too much or do you not want to really worry about that? Or are we okay with living with the problem? Yeah. 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 And so it's, it's all about reversing it and not giving, not giving unfounded information. Yeah. Because, Don't fall into the trap of being the hero. Yeah. Nate, didn't you say something about Tim Portman and his, what is your um, risk tolerance? Yes. Yeah. That's that, that question is going to make it in somewhere. Uh, it, it, we were talking about that more so on a, a sizing front, like, you know, sizing. But if it's here too, do you want a free quote and, and assume yeah. all responsibility yeah, without really clarity on what's going on with this house? Or do you want to pay for some diagnostics and, and load calcs and narrow in on, you know, reduce the size of, of the risk that you're taking yeah. and have me partner with you on that risk? Yeah. I mean, houses are complicated. I mean, it's the two answers. It depends and close cell spray foam, <laughs> cell spray foam. <laughs> and badass HVAC. Like yeah. those, those are the answers to like so many of these, but uh, how do you get somebody there? And it's like, so we could try this, but there's a fair amount of risk there. What's your risk tolerance? Um, like if, if we choose the wrong system, we may not be able to fix it without replacing it again. That's the risk. How do you feel about that risk? Um, is that a risk you're willing to take? Uh, Tim meant it in a way that uh, all of us here are now used to. Like, So the comfort consult, to define it for those that don't know it, um, it's kind of the first half of a really good energy audit. So it involves a blower door test and a good interview. So, uh, it, we usually test which rooms leak the most, a little bit of infrared if the weather's appropriate, and then a budget discussion. So you're trying to pull a whole lot of information about both the client and the house so that you can determine what the next step is. Um, that creates the next fork in the road. Uh, but uh, it, like, particularly if you're running a comfort consult and you're like, well, we could do this size or we could do this size. We're kind of on the edge. Um, if you have some risk tolerance, we can size down and do that one. Uh, and worst case scenario is you need to do some insulation and air sealing uh, if you find the energy bills too high, uh, later. or the comfort issue isn't isn't solved to your liking, satisfaction exactly. Yeah. So, it, how much risk are you willing to take? And I mean, fundamentally, what we're doing through the whole uh, HVAC 2.0 technical sales process is just trying to educate people, offer them options, and then we are trying to mitigate their risk. Um, and ours, but if they're going to make dumb decisions, we're going to do our very best to drop the results and the responsibility of that dumb decision right on their shoulders. So just so you know, I, I told you this was a bad idea. And this 1400 square foot house, 120,000 BTU furnace is a little big. Have you, have you noticed any, you know, noise issues or short cycling issues? You sure you want another 120,000 BTU furnace? Yeah. And the well, likely load range shows 25,000 to 40,000. <laughs> Yeah. You're going to say, Ken? Do the registers float off of the floor when the furnace turns yeah. on? <laughs> the, the, the drapes do this. Um, and oil canning is always my favorite when you, you flip it on in the basement or wherever you are to hear it go, bloom, bloom, um, filling up just like, ooh, yeah, that's TV that's cool. remote in their lap. <laughs> So, but yeah, risk reduction is a, a good thing. So Austin, do you, do you spend much time talking to clients about reducing their risk? Um, uh, like, I, it, well, the odds of success you probably deal with in the comfort consult report. What, what, what kind of odds and options do you usually give people? Um, typically it's like the, I'll toss in like single stage HVAC, um, like multi-stage variable. 
I always keep the air sealing p- portion in there and then I'll like combine them all for the last step. Um, obviously with greater odds of success. Um, but I feel like for like even going back to that, that one um, that we we're talking about earlier with those pillars, right. Um, going into decreasing risk or um, ranges for risk that, that he's acceptable with. We had talked about that, right? Air sealing up some of the knee wall attics uh, that are leaky in his wife's craft room um, and putting in the right size HVAC equipment. You know, he has a whole home attic fan uh, right right yeah. in front of a return register. And I turned, the, I turned the blower door off and I got up in the attic and I, I told him to take his phone and record a video of what happened. And I just get up there and I start fogging the attic. And he was like narrating this video for me. Like, oh, wow. There's so much smoke being pulled in there. <laughs> so like, yeah. you know, again, I feel like the process of it all and showing those guys, these things really gets their, their, their mind turning. And at, by the end of it, they're pretty up to speed with what's going on and what they may yeah. need to do in order to really address comfort. And then, like, get it ideal, perfect, right? Um, so, and I feel like the the report responsibly um, details that and absolves me of responsibility by informing them of what may need to happen uh, in order to achieve that as well. In a documented manner, Correct. right? A really so back documented. To what you guys were saying, uh, you know, if you decide to make choose poorly you know we can go back and we can we can read the report over and it's in there i promise you it is so who here thinks of uh uh, indiana jones and the holy grail yeah Uh, like he chose poorly (laughs) 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 Um, that's a yeah, there's the yeah. meme I love. It's like, a, boy, you'd be really stupid to put a whole bunch of money into this 17 year old uh, R22 system and take my money. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, like yeah. I'll do it, but you know, if it dies next week, sign here. Um, Nate says some good comments in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Um, so, uh, oh, there we are. <laughs> This this comment definitely cracked me up. So heating cooling services, thanks. Uh, slow and painful is more realistic for a technical sales process. We're, we're hoping to not make it take that much longer. Um, so some will, some won't. Uh, but the, the ones that take longer, if you're asking good questions and you're genuinely curious, the odds of getting that sale go up a lot. That's what I got that feedback from Jeff too, is a lot of people were like, wow, you know, nobody else asked those questions. Yeah. And, and, and the homeowner kind of appreciates having a couple of questions about them that show that you're, you know, that you're worried about getting it right. Right. Yeah. But I've even had it like where a client will initially tell me no on something. And then like, I'll try, I'll do some reversing and like, you know, they still say no, but then we'll get to talking about something else. And they'll be like, oh yeah, well we put space heaters over here and when we, you know, and so the more you get them, you know, comfortable and, and get them thinking about things and maybe it's not them not wanting to give you information, but maybe they don't understand what I'm trying to say. Um, and then, the, and then I will get that information later on. Right. So I feel like that is having the right questions to ask and and doing a little bit of digging and things is is really beneficial. And having the sandler that makes you feel OK about asking those questions. Yeah. Right. Which yeah, Austin, for, I, hey, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say. As far as for the free quote process, though, and I believe Jeff talked about this last week, is it really comes down to kind of gauging like the prospect themselves. Because if you go, if you're going into a situation where this person is all they already know who they're going to use, they just have to get three bids, or if they're just looking for the cheapest thing possible or whatever, you want to do it the way last week's went. You want to just go through it. Hey, I did my due diligence. I offered you the things that I need to offer you. I 
gave you all the information that you need. And so when you go with the cheapest guy and it screws up, you can't blame me. But if you go in and you're asking a few questions and you can tell that you're starting to kind of turn up some pain, well, then it is going to be worth it doing more the uh, two weeks ago, the way Reedy did it. Because then when you're going in and asking these questions, there's meat to it. It's, there, it's beneficial for both people to kind of get that information. So it just comes down to gauging, is this worth my time or not? Yeah. And like you said, Tanner, if you ask the questions and they give you teenager answers, good, fine, but you document <laughs> it. And then later they're like, well, but there was this. And I'm like, I asked you this question and you yeah. gave me this answer. You I'm said not good. Psychic. Yeah. Yeah. Like what am I supposed to do? Uh, so worst case you cover your butt, best case you, you find out more about what they're looking for and they're very likely to buy a nicer piece of equipment than they might uh, otherwise and probably pay for better install too, which reduces your callback risk and their satisfaction over time. Yes. Yeah. Reedy said he's been selling much larger jobs using the free quote. And I think one of the things that seems to be happening is just, you know, Nate's smiley faces. Like having those, having mm-hmm. packages, different packages where people can clearly relate each package back to the six functions in the six fun- functions video. I, I have a feeling people are looking at that six functions video and there are some functions there that are triggering them, even if they're not really aware of it or they don't express it and they're like oh yeah i would like that feature right you know yeah but because of the conversation or whatever they it doesn't it doesn't bubble up and so you're not aware of it but then when they go here and they make the decision they buy better or best because they don't like the frowny face in that particular function yeah yeah well it actually makes sense to them I mean, that's really what it come down to is like when you offer options, I mean, I know before we had this, like my whole thought process was how do I create something to where when you show it to a customer, they actually know what it is you're showing it to them. Because I mean, all the things that I've seen in the past has just basically, here's what it does. It goes, this one's least efficient. And this one over here is the most efficient. And then we're going to cram a bunch of buzzwords in between these two points that you have no clue about. And we're going to hope you're impressed by us. We're going to hope you're going to read this and go, wow, this guy's really smart. I can't even pronounce this. Meanwhile, they know nothing as to far as what's the difference between them all. And so right. it's funny. It's like it's something as simple as just, hey, you can actually read this and understand what the difference is in a single stage heat pump and a five stage inverter. Yeah, jargon is pretty much kept out of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the hope. I mean, it, like we've we've spent years trying to take really complex uh, concepts and break them down into something that be pretty quickly communicated uh, in a way that's useful to everyone. And that's and years putting together the questions so they they were in kind of this jigsaw puzzle way of connecting. Yep, yep. Everything. It, it, I mean. If you spend some time with the client at the free quote and you show them five and a half minutes worth of video, um, sometimes with them, sometimes without them. And so you set everything up with the six functions, the load matching, dehumidification, mixing, filtration, fresh air, and humidification. Um, And then you show them options of how they actually get those. They can connect the dots. It's not that hard. And it's connected to what uh, uh, their... um, their knowledge of their car is. So I chuckle here, heating, cooling services. Yes. So the opposite of the new flat rate, um, it might yes. be. Um, uh, well, so I'm, I, I'm thinking is the new flat rate a better service for the technician? I mean, that's what it was designed for in my understanding. Cause I mean, most service technicians are better at being a tech than they are at sales. Um, so that at least helps them offer clients options. But the 2.0 process is much more about replacing the equipment, not offering uh, yeah. the repair options. Yeah, it's it's all about repair. And I think this may be a hot take, uh, so get mad if you want to. I don't care. Um, 
I think it is a good idea. It's a good concept in terms of the menu pricing, in terms of offering packages and that such. But I think it was executed poorly. Oh, so people, so this kind of a comment is because it's not executed well. Yes. Well, I mean, I think when you, when you take a good idea and I mean, it like when you boil it down, it's, it, it's actually pretty good. I mean, you basically, you go to a service call, you see what's wrong with it. And then you provide them five different options from band-aid repair all the way to a, you know, refresh, rebuild, whatever you want to call it. Like that's good. The problem is when you start, uh, cause in a sense it's packaged in a way to where the upper tiers is meant to sell things that aren't really needed. And it's uh, done so in it's a way because it's as opposed to avoiding yes. response. It's, it's going it's, beyond responsibly avoiding responsibility for offering choices to trying to sell people stuff they don't need. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like, and when you look at them, like they have it pre-programmed, Oh, you buy the top option. Well, guess what? We're going to replace your disconnect. Why the hell do you need to replace a disconnect? Does uh, it work? Yes or no. But the thing is, right. when you if you re change the verbiage to where it's oh this is a you know electrical emergency stop device oh geez and you uh, re change the wording and somebody goes oh well if I buy this top tier option I'm getting all these additional things they have no idea what those are but they're just it's just a way of adding stuff in and getting people to buy things without them really understanding <laughs> yes because I know for me. If I went behind a tech that used the new flat rate and sold a bunch of nonsense and I just started asking questions to the homeowner like, hey, like, why did you buy this? Why did you buy that? They're going to look at that previous company and go, wow, those are a bunch of scumbags. They sold me a bunch of stuff that I didn't really need. And I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to ask them questions. Hey, like, what was wrong with this connect? Hey, what was what was wrong with this? They said they replaced. They said you had an AC problem, but you replaced a bunch of furnace components. What was going on there? Why did they do that? And uh, yeah, sure, it works great by selling things because they don't know what's going on. But if the whole pro- point is to build a relationship and create a relationship basis with your customers, not just transactional, it's not too good because you're just kind of banking on the fact that they don't start asking too many questions like what is this you know surge suppression voltage regulating device you know, capacitor uh, it, it's a capacitor like, yeah. let's... <laughs> it, it boils down to obfuscating and upselling oh yes. i get it so, now. so there's a balance too like the the other side of it though that i do like um is uh it does help service techs who you know don't I, have I don't know if anybody here has met a social service techs right, right. Um, they, yeah. they, 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 like i mean seriously they just need to push a button and turn the ipad around and and put it in their face like i'm not saying it's all that way but i've met some service techs that like people skills are not there they <laughs> love the machine and they hate the person yes yeah yeah um so the so tool it, itself is it's good yeah it's oh, just, yeah I was thinking the same thing too, because you know, ultimately, like it, it's 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 a difference in like philosophy and how we approach it, right? Between H Y two point and new flat rate. Right? I think at its core, I like the idea that I mean, you know, that you need a process, and if you know, and you know, when you send text into people's houses, rather than they try to come up with a customized solution for everybody all the time. And be on this pressure to like close every sale when you go in and, and and then have your hours tracked and have like you know no fee service calls and all of these things tracked. Show up there, have a very defined set of menus, and then you takes it takes like the thinking out of or t- takes the pressure off of your head, and you can offer the customer these choices. They pick one of those and then you can go with it. And I think there's value for some. Uh, companies mm-hmm. like in lot I can I mean, you guess tell me if I'm wrong, my instinct is wrong on this. I can see value in these large, like consolidated conglomerates, right? Who've got like I don't know, 400, 500 guys working for them. They can't be like responsible for like managing every single one and trying to do the all the sales and tracking, blah blah blah. So just show up, give them menu options, let them pick, and then we'll just swap in, swap out. It works for a lot of companies, right? Yeah. And that's, well, plus, uh, that's how they do if like the tech's for, like, not trained all that well. You want to make sure that certain things get offered. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean this this is uh really what we're we're talking about. I mean, b- between what 2.0 is and new flat rate is, they are trying to solve for the lowest common denominator. They they could be what we are <clears throat> only for the service side. 100%. Versus to say, well, we're trying to accomplish in the sales side that they could be that tool, but you got to be careful who sets it up because it yeah. sounds like it requires a lot of setup. And it also sounds like they may have already kind of queered it a little bit by using um, terms names. that aren't, they don't correlate back to really what the equipment is that they're selling. Yeah. Yeah. Made up names that don't make it simple. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's, okay. it's on the capacitor front. I chuckle because that that is a pain in the butt when a homeowner is like, "Well, but I can get this thing for fifteen bucks." It's like, go for it. Yeah, yeah. I was listening to uh, um, what was it? One of the one of these YouTube things. The guy was saying that um, a team Adams sold somebody a capacitor and they killed themselves installing it. Ooh, something like that. Like, mm. you know. Well, at least he was an electrical bucks. engineer. He said he knew how to do everything and all the rest of the stuff. I don't like. Okay, that, that was dark, Tanner. That was dark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's my fault. <laughs> I thought I was muted. Damn it. <laughs> Man, you and Chris Bob, whew, say, you, you two are brothers from another mother. Uh, that's so funny. Uh, but yeah, it's a, but I mean, it, taking it back to the lowest common denominator, the HVAC industry moving forward, we have a couple of really, really major challenges. So one is we have a crap ton of people retiring and we have almost no one coming in on the other side. Uh, we have the challenge of most of the younger generation doesn't have a ton of mechanical ability because stuff doesn't break. Um, and so we do need to think lowest common denominator. How do we take newbies and bring them up to speed so they can be useful as quickly as possible while still being useful to the clients? Yeah, it's a, a, Ted, stop flashing that crap while I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> Jerk. Oh, God, um, I like it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Some of these comments are, are, you know, we don't want to let them go away. I know. We need to come back to them. So, yeah, yeah. well, uh, yeah, Tom, Leck, like, that was a while ago. So, that sorry. That we don't always. Know, got, we're, we, we, we get rolling and don't talk about it. So, Tom said, uh, did. when did the linoleum floor uh, uh, puffs up in the well, center like a balloon. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah, that's a, I, I haven't really seen that with an air handler, but I definitely made some carpet flutter uh, with the blower door one time. Uh, that's it lifted up a couple inches. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I've got video of that somewhere. Uh, Cause that's one of those things like you don't really believe it till you see it. Uh, it's like, really that did it. Um, and man, did we kick the air leakage on that one. Um, and yeah. going back to the, the, like the very first thing that we were talking about, it's my house and doing the, the caulking. Um, so uh, R134 a-hole, man, I just, I, I love that handle, man. Um, like that's really good. And it's a whole W H O L E for someone who's listening later. Um, so, uh, he used foam board inside. So it would have been in between the studs for a boathouse office, a uh, four inch in the ceiling window unit works great now here in Florida. Um, yep. That's seems like a perfect application. It is. And well, it's another instance of, uh, uh, the, the only answers are it depends closed cell spray foam and badass HVAC. Um, so it, basically you got the, the benefit of closed cell out of that. Um, yeah, so I think you put foam really in, the, in, the rough in a situation like that, it's, it's radiant. Yes, the radiant benefit of of not having like every surface is is a tin roof. Timmy, hey Tim, <laughs> what's up? I didn't even see him down there until just now, so we just startled him. So, no, but you can hear him before you see him because his microphone is messed up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yeah. it's all it's maybe. <laughs> Is it feedback? A, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So, uh, um, uh, so Nate, before before you got distracted, 
uh, by Ted's flashing. You were, <laughs> you were, you were saying uh, it's a kid friendly show, family show. Come on. <laughs> the, cha the challenges that the HVAC industry has going forwards is that a lot of people are retiring and young people coming in may not have similar mechanical abilities. And so the industry needs some kind of systems and processes, right, to help yep. get these kids up to speed. Uh, and so things like new flat rate, HVAC 2.0, and Magic perhaps quick. others. Yeah. Magic quick, yeah. All of these are ways to get people up to speed. Is that, is that the point you're, you were making? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was I was talking to a, a large HVAC contractor in New York a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he puts 10 weeks of training into new employees. That's really expensive. And I mean, particularly when you don't know, are they going to work or not? So you may put two and a half months of training wages into them and you put them out in the field. They're like, screw this and they quit. Um, so the, in my mind, the faster you can make them reasonably useful, put them in the field to where you can understand where their strengths and weaknesses really are and then aim them in a direction that might be better for them. Um, and then give them more and better for you. Exactly. It's better Thank for you. everyone because, uh, in general, moving forward, we're going to have to hire for attitude as much as aptitude. So if, if there's at least the kernel of mechanical aptitude or sales aptitude, um, but they have a good attitude, we can work with that. If the attitude sucks, good luck. And so that's that's going to be a real challenge for a long time. I mean, we're, we're going to be in a skilled labor shortage for probably 20 years. Because we've spent too long saying, go to college, go to college, go to college. I mean, I'm 45. And well, I'm and also years ago being told to go to college. And, and also did. giving out participation awards. So, that, so these people are really total. We're on full on idiocracy here, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> so when, so what's the status of like apprenticeship programs and stuff in the U.S.? What's apprenticeship? So, I don't know. I don't know what it's like down south from us here in Canada, but typically you don't go. So usually you don't have to go to a trade school for four years, spend, I don't know, $30,000, $50,000, then try to go get a job. You get fast tracked into, a, you know, like a kind of a learn as you go kind of role. Yeah. Where you replace in class hours with on job hours kind of, is, is how I understand it. Mm -hmm. That's that's largely a union arrangement. I see. And and oftentimes you need to know somebody to get into a union. <laughs> and yeah, unions are fine for their protection, but they've also overreached themselves. And, and they're so not a big player in residential HVAC anyway, right? No, not yeah. at all. It's it's commercial and primarily government work where you right. have to use uh, union labor. So, uh, and some of that could be interesting. I remember going to a trade show years ago with, uh, uh, my grandpa selling a creeper, which you lie in when you work under a car, it costs us as much money to ship it from Cleveland to Chicago as it did to take it from the bay to inside where the booth was. Um, and we learned that one year we just, it was a creeper that could hold a ton of weight. So we stacked everything from the booth on top of the creeper and didn't look anybody in the eye and just pushed and hope we didn't get caught because it cost 500 bucks. Um, and, uh, uh like that, that could be the challenge of unions. Like that was just kind of over the top in Chicago, how that was. Um, so yeah, we, we need better training programs, but the curse is we, we don't have funding and we don't have time. <laughs> So we need stuff that's cheap and inexpensive that can bring people in quick. We, well, we need good, fast, and cheap. There you go. Look at that. Um, uh, so if I'm remembering, if I'm remembering right, I think Tim, your your third generation, is it right? Your granddad's. No, shop? my dad. Though. Second, second, second yeah. yeah. And then Ken, your kids are now taking over your shop. Is that right? My son and and one of our grandsons is working there although he's in sales. Right on. And so what was it? So then for you, was it, was it any easier to be in the family or like, did you like, I mean, I'm trying to think like, it's, it's, it's an easy pathway to apprenticeship in a way, right? Cause you are always around people, you learn on the go and you know, you could have picked up these things in ways that maybe people like me who have to go to a school or something can't pick up. 
Like, does that offer any, I don't know, like a better path, easier path? Yes. Yeah, so into the I, field? I would have to say yes. Um, and an, another of my sons worked for us and then struck out on his own. Uh, he learned very well. Um, I, and I think that's a great way to learn is hands-on uh, as well as some technical training. But unfortunately, there are way too many companies and technicians who do not have the, the background in it. They don't have the scientific understanding. They just know, okay, well, I'm looking for these numbers as pressures. Yeah. Uh, and, and they may do that well, but they need to know more. They need to have a more a deeper understanding of the refrigeration process and airflow. Uh, they, for they, they know the what, but not the why. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which leads them to the wrong how pretty often. Yeah. Um, yeah well, like, uh, um, yeah, I'm surprised how many people don't have a good grasp of external static pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's, that's like the number that you want to know looking at a system. Uh, Cause if it's an inch and it's got a PSC motor, that new new system is probably going to run 1.3 because you usually get a 30% bump when you move from PSC to ECM. And then that thing is going to eat itself alive. So you're going to be replacing that motor every couple of years, maybe, maybe more often than that. And how do you fix it? Well, they make a retrofit PSC motor, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is such an inelegant solution, but honestly, it's, there could be worse ones. Um, well, except now you dumb. have these fragile heat exchangers that if you're not getting enough yeah, airflow, just... they're going to high limit. And yep. No, that's a good point. You you, you push to the, and... you go to the next weakest link is what you yeah. do. Yeah. Um, all it does is shift the, shift the weak link. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now your compressor dies, your heat exchanger dies or, uh, you know, whatever it might be. It reminds me of years ago, a buddy of mine, he was not a car guy and he bought one of the very first Subaru WRX STIs. So it's a 300 horsepower little all-wheel drive car. And he's like, watch this. And he uh, revs it up, lets it ping against the limit and dumps the clutch. 7,000 nice. miles later, he bought a new clutch. <laughs> it's lucky he got that far. My wife's car has 214,000 miles on it with the original clutch. Um, like they can last a long time, but he found the weakest link. And honestly, mm -hmm. on Subaru's part, that was a really good thing to make the weakest link. So he didn't tear up anything in the motor. He didn't tear up anything in the drivetrain. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, but it, it's really important back to the static pressure that helps you understand an overall just quick view of what's going on. Is it high? You have a problem. If it's not that high, you're probably okay. okay so, today we're gonna get... so, if, uh, so Nate, you were saying attitude is like the big thing you have to select for, right? When you're taking on new people. So like if some young, you know, high school graduate came up and, and said, you know, I'm willing to learn, I'm, I'm willing to work hard. Like, does the industry have the ability to like take them on in some capacity or do like rules and regulations prevent you from like just bringing someone on if they don't go to like college and spend a whole load of money and stuff like that. Like I'm trying to understand like what the entry point would be for people coming into this industry and how to make that a little bit more easier. It, so it's definitely easier with larger companies than it is mm -hmm. with smaller. So I asked Brian or this years ago, cause he's got a decent sized company down in Orlando. Like, so what do you do with newbies? And he brings them on and they go through training for a while. And then he sends them out to go do maintenance with uh, apartment buildings and whatnot, usually rooftop units. So they don't, they don't have to talk to anybody and they really don't have to know anything. You're changing filters and using the hose. You know, it's really, really simple stuff. How about um, install? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you can send them out. I, man, I think of uh, an apprentice that I met um, and I, I go downstairs and the two guys that he's working with his journeyman are just hard on this kid. Like this is Carl. And he looks at me really softly goes, my name's Kyle. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the hazing that poor kid took. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and I, I saw him a while later uh, at a, a festival uh, for one of the towns nearby. I'm like, hey, Kyle, how you doing? It's like, yeah, I don't work there anymore. Um, oh, he couldn't take the hazing? Uh, that was a lot of hazing. So, so there's a balance. Some hazing is important, frankly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 
yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's getting people pushed into the right direction. I mean, there's there's a reason. Well, Ted, uh, it's <laughs> Mr. Arlie Ermy, um, <laughs> th- there's a reason that uh, you know boot camp's pretty hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're trying to mold you and, and pull you in a certain direction, but you need to have a good attitude about it in the first place or it's hard. Um, and uh, I don't know how to haze. I just go straight to beating. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the problem. <laughs> I, I, I probably should have t- I skipped the hazing class. That definitely. I think, I think uh, if I had gone to hazing class, a lot less problems would have occurred. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. um, but but Be- obviously it, it, beatings will continue until morale improves, morale improves. <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. exactly. but uh yeah uh, Abby, i mean you you keep bringing it back to the the subject of what what do we do to bring in new people and get people up to speed because uh, the other challenge we have is in moving to ec motors we used to be able to get away with murder. We could install things horribly. Um, and the heat exchangers would survive and the motors they would survive. And the coils would survive. Um, I mean, it was just, it's amazing how bad you could put stuff in. Um, now for better or for worse, the efficiency standards have now moved us to where we've got really thin coils. Um, we have sensitive heat exchangers and we have motors that make a prima donna soccer player look like a tough guy. Um, so, I mean, it's it, it. If we don't, as an industry, raise the quality of the average install, we're going to get eaten alive on warranty costs, and we're already starting to see that um, all over the place. Um, <clears throat> so, if you aren't sizing right and you aren't paying attention to uh, static pressure and you aren't doing whatever you can to responsibly avoid responsibility when the clients make stupid decisions, guess who's going to eat that cost? Find your nearest mirror. Um, that's who's going to eat it. Uh, so how do we adjust all this with a skilled labor shortage and, and equipment that is now substantially more finicky than it has been in the past? Automated questions process. Well, that helps on the sales side, and which is really important too. If you sell the wrong equipment, I mean, what do you do? Um, let's say Jeff was really good at going in after a four-ton mic and giving them a brand new system. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think Bob margin maybe finding himself in that position now. Yeah, we'll see where it all goes. I was but, uh, I was down in the U.S. a couple of days ago to watch uh, some Major League Baseball, and uh, I stopped at Fargo, North Dakota, a small small city, right in a small state. Yeah, they had a sign outside at the Arby's, and I don't even know if they have Arby's in Canada. I've never been in one. But I know what an Arby's is, and so I'd say the Arby's they were they were hiring people for twenty dollars an hour U.S. Oh, I know, like right? 30, mm-hmm. Thirty bucks an hour here in Canadian, right? Like I don't think like entry level techs make that kind of money here in Canada. I don't imagine. Well, like, they're getting to where they have to, is the problem, right? Um, and yeah, that's that's a challenge as well. Uh, so how do we solve this moving forward? I don't know all of the pieces. <laughs> Well, well I, so, just, let's talk a little, I, I watched this, I watched the thing Jim Bergman did, the measure quick thing. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit because on the technician side, um, could that potentially help? Well, I don't know if they have a training process for those guys or how any of that works. Well, they do just Ted. Um, cause when I first saw it, uh, I, I mean, I, I bought probes and hooked up a, a heat pump with measure quick. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, man. No <laughs> clue. And it was before they had, they had it set up for heat pumps. So all the, ne- the numbers came in negative. So it worked. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> but <laughs> I couldn't set it as that, but it, it got a lot more complicated since then. And they've now launched guided workflows and I haven't really played with them, but uh, it's supposed to be much, much easier to learn how to use it. Um, and it, it is funny, like uh, for five bucks a system and it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's yearly, but if you commission the system and you put the data in and you never touch the system again, you don't pay the five bucks again in talking to Jim. I, I had dinner with Jim a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, man, five bucks is so freaking cheap. We are so penny wise and pound foolish. It's absolutely insane. Um, right. Cause now you got all that stuff documented too. It's like, 
hard documentation. This is how it was when I left here. And when something is wrong with it, it shows you what the likely fixes are. It's like OBD2 with your car where it pops a code. Oh, you just got to wow. go type in the code and, and you see, uh, you know, what, what the three different issues it could be are. And then you can show the homeowner that now you're not making stuff up. You're, you're not making right. up some long you name. You like are talking out of your ass and trying to weasel this out is of real. something. Yeah, this is absolutely real. So that's that's why I've been a, a fan of it for a long time. But it got so complicated. Like I'm, I, I watched the Facebook group and I'm like, I don't know what the hell anybody's talking about anymore. I'm not a tech and I am lost. Uh, and I think it's just come back to where you can actually use it again, um, which is great. So a couple of other wonderful comments in here. Um yeah, guided workflows. So they just came out with guided workflows. That's going to make it way easier because we, we need good, fast, and cheap. And I'm sorry, five bucks a system is dirt cheap. Um, uh, we can argue about whether that was the right call or not, but yeah. th it's it's dirt cheap. But um, when it's a, a race to the bottom for the price, that five bucks doesn't fly. Well, if $5 is a make or break situation, uh, you're already in a very bad place. It's not a job. So, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Like, measure quick's not the problem at that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's customer expectations. The Walmart yeah. mentality. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's part of it too. I mean, I, I also look at that. I mean, there's, there's the client side and the contractor side, but mm -hmm. like as a homeowner, if 500 bucks is going to break you, you probably shouldn't own a home. Because there's so many different risks that can end up costing 500 bucks. Yeah, you okay. should probably be renting so that your, your monthly expense is highly predictable. Even if it's a higher monthly expense, um, that, that's probably the better way to go. And I like this comment too. The HVAC industry is a basket case in so many different ways. Glad you all are trying to make it better. So, and glad you're here <laughs> trying to help <laughs> us figure it out too. Um, but it, Man, things are going to get so complicated, and everyone here probably knows that I'm a big electrification fan, but I'm also terrified of what that's going to do to the industry. Yeah. <laughs> the, the industry is not ready. Um, Jim and I are definitely uh, in agreement on that. I, I really, I think that going with a hybrid for your first year when you want to start doing heat pumps, hundred percent, really got to encourage people to to you know, put the belt and suspenders on and then decide which one they want to take off. hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, it, and size to cooling. So if it's got a three ton AC there and your, your duct pressure isn't super high. Yeah. Just do a three ton heat pump. It could be single stage, whatever, put it on top of the furnace, move on with life. Um, put an echo. Watch run times. Yeah. And watch your runtime. Um, and it, it, you do five or 10 of those one year, uh, get your echo B logins from the clients and, you're not going to be scared the next year. Um, but that static pressure better be reasonable. <laughs> that thing's going to eat itself alive. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's really I, fun when people call you and, and like that, that picture that you had the other day, Nate, with that infinity system running. Oh no, it was a train system. Oh yeah. Yeah. Running, running at 70% capacity in yeah. a 3000 square foot house. And it's a three ton system. And I, I joke about train their their low end output is sucky. I, I joke the train skips leg day. Um, cause they don't have any <laughs> bottom end. Um, I mean, they so. just don't, they're terrible. Uh, but they, they don't overclock their compressors. Um, so I don't think they have vapor injection in them, but that thing was still running like, and client was happy. Bills are reasonable. Um, but this is a point too here as well. The manufacturers design stuff to last 10 years in one day versus a lifetime. So yeah, agreed heating cooling services, hundred um, percent. I mean, it's, I don't know how we go, how we turn that around. It's like, we, we need the equivalent of Japanese cars. Cause American cars absolutely sucked in the seventies. They were horrible mm -hmm. and then the japanese came in using our own ideas it was w edwards deming ideas to create the toyota production system and they kicked our butts on quality and that led to cars being so freaking high quality now that it's actually part of the reason behind our our labor shortage because you don't have to know how to fix things anymore um so that that's a challenge but how do we get 
the equipment to, to last longer. Now, to be fair, we can give the OEMs a hard time on one side, but on the other side, they've got all of these efficiency standards they need to adhere to. So we move from R22 that runs at 100, 150 PSI to R410, which runs at 150, 250, maybe 300 PSI. And then we use thinner metal for better efficiency, better heat transfer. And what do you get? Systems that leak more often. Um, higher pressures, lower, uh, thinner metal. That sounds like a good combination. Um, uh, so there's a whole bunch of things going on here. The only real solution in my mind is better installs. Does anybody else? Like, uh, Completely agree. Start with the design step. Yeah. Better yeah. installs starting at the design step. Can't fix a bad design yeah. right at the install step. Very so, seldom does that get fixed yeah and it's well, got to be sized yeah. Yeah. i mean gotta when be. you if you have a problem i mean the only way to truly address a problem is you have to bullet down to it's just like basic core components and when you bullet down and you look at okay what's the very first initial issue is oh most people have the wrong unit for their house well there's a problem and the only way you address that is at the initial design step right <laughs> This, it, this is a, a really tough problem, um, but uh, I, I do want to just touch on Ryan's comment here. Ryan Kerr said, actually size, not rule of thumb. Yeah, uh, although this is going to be extremely challenging on the, the free quote size or side because I, I, you don't know enough to actually size anything accurately. You just don't. So, Ryan, what do you, what do you think of about the um, likely load range and how, how we're approaching that? Coming in with a range, a high low, rather than saying this is the load. Um, cause uh, you give have me you gone into the software and played with it at all. He, uh, I doubt that he would have just recently. Um, I'll give him a call. Um, so I think on the equipment, uh, like lifetime and how long they last night, like I agree with you, better installs are the way to go from within the industry. But I think from outside the industry, there's things like right to repair laws and things like that. Right. Like you can't, I mean, some phones you you are not allowed to fix your own phone or fix your own car because it voids warranty yes. i imagine it's the same thing with hvac and having like maintenance plans and upgrade plans and require you know that some some of these things might help extend mm -hmm. the life of these things a little bit i was actually this this device now you guys probably know this like i, I think there's a company here in canada called avx and uh, there's yeah. one in the u.s called uh smart ac or something where yep. i've got yeah. one here yeah, so you, you can continuously monitor the system and then just make sure that you're staying on top of regular maintenance and things like that. That can stretch that somewhat, right? Yes. But, but there's so much external pressure because mm -hmm. people don't live in their forever home. Most people don't live in their forever home anymore. So what do you care if an AC lasts 30 years or, or eight years because you're gone in seven? That's the average in most American and Canadian yeah. Um, yeah. places. So that's a good tough point. Enough. Because if you're selling, if you don't plan mm. to stay in the house, you're going to buy the cheapest equipment you can and make it somebody else's problem. Yeah. Yeah. The average well, number of years that an American or Canadian lives in a house is shrinking every year. It used to be like 15, 18. Now it's down to like eight or seven. And so mm -hmm. that just set, sets up a whole cycle of like downstream effects from that. Sorry, Tanner, I interrupted you. you were saying. Oh, it's fine. I was just going to kind of add to what you were saying to say, I mean, it really comes down to when we say fix things, like what does that actually mean? Does yeah. fix mean we're going to install the greatest systems in every single house forever? No. Or is it you just give the ability for any homeowner to choose what it is that they want? You know, because yeah. like we all know, like you mentioned, some people are like, hey, I'm only going to be here for five years. I want the cheapest thing you can give me. Yeah. And so if that's the case, give them the cheapest thing, just install it. Well, yeah. like yeah. give them the best that they can get for what they're asking for. I mean, yeah, try to help them make good decisions. Yeah. Just, that you know, a, there's, there's a, that brings to mind a, a situation. What if it's a repair situation and let's contrast the new flat rate, which it gives them a repair option cheap to, um, lots of add-ons versus the mindset of HVAC 2.0, which is what caused the problem? How deep can we go? How much time do we have and how much is the customer willing to spend 
to investigate the cause of this problem because if the equipment is oversized, they're going to constantly have uh, mechanical failures. And the only solution to that is either downsize the equipment. I'm not even sure there is another another way to address it. So yeah, we've got many layers of, of things to address here. Yeah, but it does all begin at the kitchen table at the end of the day. Yep. The, the right system, the right size system, the right install needs mm -hmm. to be offered. Because yeah. selling it isn't up to any of us at the end of the day. Like, well, we're buying it. Like, who who here buys systems? Oh, wait, that's me because we keep <laughs> buying freaking houses. Yeah. <laughs> Ken's coming down this week, actually. <laughs> he's he's going to be sitting. This is our kitchen table. This is going to be his house for a week. <laughs> um, I, I was about three. <laughs> but uh yeah, but there's a there's a limit to what we can do but as hvac professionals we can all make sure that clients are offered good choices we can't twist their arm and make them do something yeah. um but if they choose poorly we can be like sign here mm -hmm. yeah um, we just help them understand the differences it's one thing yeah. for somebody to come in and only offer one option tell them it's the greatest thing ever and that how great this brand is and it's better than any other brand. And if you don't buy from them, blah, blah, blah. Like that, that's one thing that like that's contributing to the problem. But at least if you can go in and say, I mean, we can sell you this single stage piece of crap, but just look at how it compares to all the other options. Oh, you just want the cheapest thing possible. Okay. I would go with this bottom end option. I mean, it's not going to be too great, but if you're only going to be here for four years, I mean, it's heat and cool. It. Yeah. And if you don't, and if that's too much, uh, have you thought about window units and space heaters? You're only going to be here for five years. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like c connecting the dots of what they want versus what you can offer and what is, what is the best method. That's to me, that's the way that you actually fix it. It's not by making everything magically better all in one go. Mm -hmm. It's just, at least if people are buying something, they're actually mm -hmm. understanding better what they're buying. Yeah. And understanding it's not all a commodity. Um, and I do chuckle if we went back to 75% furnaces and eight sear air conditioners, we, we almost wouldn't have to have this conversation. Yeah. That um, would last for 30 years, no matter how they were installed. I know, they were just outrageous. So I love this comment from heating yes. services. So be like the government, fix one problem and cause 10 new problems. So that's right. That's job that creation right. for that pretty you. Pretty much sir. nails it. <laughs> job creation. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my and favorite efficiency. lines is from uh, Groucho Marx in the 40s. Um, and he said that government is the art of looking for problems, finding them everywhere, misdiagnosing them, and applying the wrong solution. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and, and giving away prizes <laughs> for all the work, great work you've done. <laughs> <laughs> Saving more every day. And um, that quote uh, can apply ooh. to a lot of things besides <laughs> government. Participation <laughs> awards. All right, so there's one last thing we'll just touch on because this this goes beyond the scope of what we normally talk about. But uh, Ted, Ted and I know hers ratings and Energy Star and um, uh, ResNet and all that stuff, and it has driven us nuts for years. Um, one of the biggest rater companies is called SkyTech, and they approved the house of a friend of ours. Who? Oh, this is Terje. This is yeah. This is teased uh, um, yeah. people. Uh, okay. They they approved an absolutely hideous install of a just wrong piece of equipment. And his wife, because she's a vet and got injected with all kinds of stuff when she was over in the Middle East, is super sensitive to uh, uh, chemicals and moisture and all sorts of things. Like if you're environmentally sensitive, it's really hard. My, my mom's environmentally sensitive too. Um, and so they approved the system and it was just awful. And he tried to get restitution. Nothing happened. 18 months later, he ripped the system out entirely, put in a brand new system, including ductwork. And because he did that, they said, well, we can't help you because you did all of this. Um, what, was his, what, what was his podcast? <clears throat> um, well, uh, yeah, he was, oh, he was on a podcast. Star, with no phone. Energy star failures. Oh yeah, well the the Facebook group, oh, the was, yeah, Facebook Energy group. Star Homes, the horrors. Um, yes, he killed that go, a little yeah. while ago. But mm -hmm. uh, he was on uh, Bill Spohn's podcast a couple of years ago, uh, just talking about it. And like he's he's an engineer, and he just goes through it with like almost no emotion. And I'm like, man, 
I'd be looking for blood. Um, yeah. Like it, it, it was awful what he got put through. So anyway, Skytech just agreed to pay 2.35 million because of lying about numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, drive-by ratings. How does that, how does that impact hers or Resnut? It's probably not going to change a damn thing. Oh, geez. Sorry, Ted, so, did you say Resnut? Yeah, oh, right. So, so those guys, <laughs> those guys aren't going to have any, they have totally avoided the shit splash that they deserve. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They definitely get a major face full and have to inhale some. Um, uh, it's, it, but th- that's actually, so a lot of what we're talking about here are structures that are not designed well. Bad. No skin in the game or, or yeah, there's no skin in the game. structures where yeah, people yeah. are getting paid to do the wrong thing. Yeah. So like the efficiency standards, um, we, we, we talk a lot about how dehumidification just people are like, well, we don't care about that. We only care about sensible cooling, actually taking the heat out of the air. We're going to ignore the dehumidification, which if you aim a system to do that, it looks more efficient, but then we're going to make people in, in houses sick. Like we're in for that now. Um, and so that's a bad structure. Like it's, it, we, we, we need to consider two variables at least, but we're all looking for the one magic metric. Um, and this is a bad structure here because the builders pay for the ratings, not the homeowners. So if a rater is hard on a builder's, uh, uh house, they don't get hired next time. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a fundamental problem. And that is why there's these drive-by ratings that happen. Um, they don't get tested. They get pencil whipped. Jeff's caught a couple of them um, red-handed, like on the sticker, it has a number. Um, and then he goes and tests it and it's like 40% higher than what the blower door shows. You can't be off by that much, like not with any reasonable time frame. Um, I mean, I've calibrated my blower door against a friend and they're always within one or 2%. And so I've never sent my gauge for calibration because I've field calibrated against a friend's gauge. <laughs> you know, um, like it, it, you don't have to. Uh, but yeah, that's a bad structure. Um, here we are. Uh, heating, cooling services. The SkyTech thing is part of the problem. Sign off on garbage is all too common. So we also need good documentation. Guess what the HVAC 2.0 system does a really good job of? Um, document, document, document. Pointing fingers for responsibility. Yes, that's, that's a huge part of the not just an individual part, but government, industry, inspection, uh, installation. Nobody takes responsibility. Exactly. And homeowners, too, most importantly. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, everybody needs to have skin in the game. Um, uh, so it, you know, give people an idea of what the risks and rewards of various things are. So, all right, we're, we're, we should sign off here sometime soon. We've been going for an hour and a half, but we've all been having fun. Um, yes. And there's been this a is Monday summer. night again. Uh, yep. Yeah, this is, it's nice to do this again. Uh, so uh, peanut gallery, what do you think of this? Have you enjoyed kind of the round Robin here that we're doing more? Uh, what do you think of this? Do you want more of this? And this then good what format. Kind of questions? Yep. You'd like the format. Another thing that we can totally do with this too is uh th- this system allows us to have up to 10 people so if you send me an email at nate at hvac20.com and you want to uh come on and ask a question and have a discussion we can pull you in so it can be a, a call-in show which i'd i'd love to try out sometimes so heating and cooling services i'd i'd like to see your face because you told me your name one time and i don't remember what the heck it is now um <laughs> so <laughs> hey you um but uh if you wanted to hop in and ask some questions or something like that that would be great but what have you all thought of this kind of a format and discussion um if you don't have a chance to type it in here you can type it in the notes once we close out but uh, and on uh, youtube please like and subscribe ah uh, thank you so i start never building remember. up on uh, i don't know what is, what's it called i don't know ted the computer algorithm or yes. Yeah. We got to feed the algorithm as much as we feed can. the algorithm. That's it. So we appreciate y'all coming. So heating, cooling services. Thank you. TG Ryan care, um, uh, Tom Leck, uh, Jordan Davis. 
Um, so like there's a ton of you that have popped in here and commented. Thank you, Brett. I don't know if Brett's still here. Uh, if my favorite R134 a-hole um, <laughs> and good old LinkedIn user. Um, got good to have that. Austin on for the first time tonight. Good yeah. to see you. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah, it's good to see your face. And thank you for having a couple of stories for us mm -hmm. as well. Thanks for having me. No problem. Awesome. Austin, thanks for coming. Yeah. Yep. Well, we'll see you all next week. And next week I'll be testing out Starlink because tomorrow we take off in the camper for a couple of months. So uh, um, fingers crossed. Peace. Do you guys want to go after party or do you think we've had enough? Oh, we got to do after party. What are you talking about? Uh, all That's right. my freaking all right. choice. Um, all right. I'll see you all guys right. over there. Good night, everyone. I'll Thank see you. you guys over there. See you.